I'm here to introduce today's speaker. Today's speaker is Ross Van Dyke. He serves as Senior Director of Admissions Recruitment at Baylor University, is an avid outdoorsman, adventure seeker, and if you haven't already guessed it, he's my husband. Uh, I am honored that Vanguard asked me to speak today for this month's Wake Up Wednesday. Please help me give a warm welcome to Ross. Well, good morning. My name is Ross Van Dyke, and this is my story of perseverance. I'm here today to tell you how the life of myself and the life of several of my friends were altered forever. Each one of us in this room sees life differently. Some see it for what it can give you, and others see it for what you can give to it. And many of us live somewhere in the middle, or what I refer to as the gray, the in-between. Before I tell you what happened on June 21st, 2012, allow me to take you back before I bring you forward. This is me at age five. I love the outdoors. I loved everything about it. The trees, the air, the sound of a running stream, even the smell of a sleeping bag makes me feel alive. And here's me as a boy scout in junior high, where I spent hours and hours with my father tying knots and lighting many, many, many things on fire just for the sake of watching it burn. As I got older, my desire for adventure grew from car with my dad to what I call big stuff, marathons whitewater rafting down the Nile River and scuba diving. Some of this was because I really, really, truly enjoyed it, and some of it was honestly because I wanted to tell people that I did it, as if it made me sound hardcore or tough. Being alone in the wilderness gave me an appreciation for creation. There really wasn't a place in the world that I wouldn't go. At one point, I worked for a company that allowed me the opportunity to film or to travel the world and film documentaries. This is me in India, and this is me in Nepal. When I was 29 years old, I took a trip to Portland, Oregon to climb Mount Hood with my good friend, Drew White. This was my first mountaineering experience, and to this day, it was my best. I summited on my first attempt and felt like I was on top of the world, literally. This feeling before it was taken to new heights when I met my wife that night, Mrs. Van Dyke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see, I'm from Dallas, attended Baylor, and lived in Waco. Hannah's from Waco, attended Baylor, and lived in Dallas. And we both went to Portland, Oregon on Memorial Day weekend to visit our friends, who happened to be friends. Those friends decided that we should all hang out, and well, the rest is history. <laughs> now, by a show of hands here, who's seen the movie The Bucket List? Okay. For those that haven't, the premise is that there was a couple of older gentlemen that have a list of things that they'd like to accomplish or cross off their list before they die. That movie really impacted me to do something similar, and I walked away from that movie and developed what I call my life list. Now, my thought at the time was, I have some time before I die. I could always be adding things to the list while I was crossing other things off, and one of the things on my list was to climb the Denali, also known as Mount McKinley in Alaska, which is the tallest peak in North America. <coughs> now, most people that desire to climb a peak like that normally start with what are called lesser peaks in order to train and prepare for an ordeal that takes two to three weeks to pull off. After climbing Mount Hood, I proceeded to pursue my dream of mine and my climbing several other peaks in the Pacific Northwest. Mount Rainier in Washington State is the largest glaciated stratovolcano in the continental United States, and it stands at 14,411 feet. It's truly a marvel of all who lay eyes upon her. On Tuesday, June 19, 2012, our team set out to climb Mount Rainier. This was a long-time goal and a training climb to eventually go to Mount McKinley in Alaska. Without going into too much detail, when climbing a peak like this, you have two vital tools. You have crampons, which are metal spikes that adhere to the bottom of your insulated boots to gain purchase on the ice and in the snow, as well as an ice axe. The ice axe is used more like a cane, and it works as an additional foot. Now, the rule is that you don't move your feet unless your axe is set, and you don't move your, your axe until your feet are set. And think of it like an additional foot, okay? And then in addition to these tools, you're roped up to the person in front and behind you with 20 feet of dynamic rope. Dynamic simply means that it stretches a little bit versus the rope that you would see on a rope swing, which is static, which means it doesn't move. This element's done in case someone falls. Over the course of the next two days, we had put ourselves in good position to make an attempt on the summit. And Thursday, June 21st, we broke ground around 2.30 a.m. and made a smooth ascent to the summit at 14,411 feet. After about 20 minutes on the summit, we decided to descend. I was the first climber on the rope team, and we made a descent of about 1,000 feet below the summit. And I heard someone yell, falling. 
Immediately, I jumped onto my axe to self-arrest. I thought about my wife, and I said to myself, this is it, this Ross, this is how you're going to die. You see, the portion of the Yemen's glacier that we were descending was rather steep, approximately 45 degrees. The slope was 3,000 feet until there was a runoff to stop, and then that's if we didn't hit a crevasse first. And so I knew that my life was over. Now, it might be helpful to know that crevasses or holes or gaps in the ice. A glacier is a frozen river that slowly moves down the mountain. When certain sections of the glacier move against each other, they form chasms in the ice. These can range from a couple feet to several hundred feet deep. I remember being pulled from the slope, tumbling, and then nothing. I blacked out. A great wordsmith, Ray Lewis of the Baltimore Ravens, once said that if tomorrow wasn't promised, what would you give for today? Forget everything else. Forget everything else. Forget that there was any sunlight left. What would you spend today thinking about? Yourself or the person next to you? At some point in our lives, we will all deal with our own mortality, some earlier and some later. At some point, I came to. I was dazed and confused, and I remember everything being very quiet and very still, like in a movie when a bomb goes off. After the destruction and the chaos, there's a stillness before the carnage is assessed. At this point, I was bewildered that I was still alive. I looked around and I realized that I was still attached to the rope. I remember hearing nothing, and then all of a sudden, I heard everything. I saw all of my teammates except for one. I began to inspect myself to find that something was not, not quite right with my leg. And at the time, I thought that I had broken my femur. My instinct was to pull out the cell phone that I had in my pack and place a call for help, but the call did not go through. I realized that I still had my ice axe that was still attached with a leash. And so I used my ice axe in one hand and my one good leg, and I proceeded to slowly climb up about 40 feet higher on the mountain. I pulled out my phone. I called 911. The call was able to go through, and I was informed by the dispatcher that there had been an, um, I let him, uh, that uh, I called 911. I let them know that there had been an accident on the Emmons Glacier and that we were about 1,000 feet below the summit. I was told that it would take about an hour and a half for someone to reach us, and that they were dispatching rangers by foot as well as a Chinook helicopter by the United States Army. It's at this point that I realized what had taken place. As we proceeded to tumble down the mountain, most accounts say between two and 300 feet, one of our team members had fallen into a crevasse. That crevasse snagged us and kept us from falling further down the glacier. You can think of it like a seesaw. If they had not fallen to the hole, we would have continued to fall down the mountain. Three of the four of us had injuries that rendered us incapable of getting ourselves down including one that was hanging upside down in a crevasse. In the time that it took us four hours to go where we were going on the mountain, the rangers covered that ground in just over one hour. They assigned a ranger to each of us who assessed our injuries and made a determination that I was to be taken second in line of the four of us via a Chinook helicopter. For those that had never seen one of these beasts, it can hold about 50 soldiers and few helicopters, it can fly over 10,000 feet. The way the rescue worked was they would fly in they would lower a litter, think of it like a large stretcher. They would leave so that they could secure us, then they would fly back, lower a cable to hook us, and then they would raise us into the belly of a chopper. My teammate in the crevasse was taken first, and then they came for me. Before they did that, they were lowering an additional litter for one of my teammates when all of a sudden the Chinook left. All I could say is, where did it go? Why did it leave? I, I didn't understand. I was not given an answer other than, Ross, you're going to spend the night up here until a clear window arrives for you to get you out. At this stage, I was in so much pain that I had no idea how I was going to make it the next 10 minutes, much less the next 24 hours. Roughly three hours later, when it couldn't have seemed to get worse, things began to change in our favor. June 21st, 2012 happened to be the summer solstice, which means that it was the longest day of the year. I was told that the Army was going to make one more attempt to secure us before a massive storm came in. The chopper came in, and through four or five attempts, they were able to lower the cable, lock me in, and I was whisked away. Once the chopper, once in the chopper, there was a team of Army medics who began to work on me while the pilots worked to secure our third team member. After the third team member was secured, the chopper banked hard and flew to Magan Army Hospital in Tacoma, Washington, leaving one more team member on the mountain. Once there, I was examined and told that I had dislocated my hip and suffered a pulmonary embolism. Essentially because of the trauma in my leg, my body developed a blood clot, blood clot on the, my right calf. The clot at some point broke free, went through my heart, and splattered into my lungs. 
The doctor said that it would take a year to walk again if I was able to survive the clot in my lungs. After the hip was put back into place, the doctors cleared the room and asked if I wanted to place a call to my wife. I called Hannah to let her know what had happened, and the doctors had called her prior to let her know that I was alive. Though it was an emotional call once we got to speak. After talking for several minutes, we told each other that we loved each other and we ended the call. And I remember being completely alone in the room. Not soon after I ended the call, an army officer entered the operating room and asked if I was Ross Van Dyke. I told him that I was, and he told me that he, he, he it pained him, but that he regretted, regretted to inform me that there was a ranger that was killed in my rescue. It's at this point that I realized that what I had occurred when the chopper left that day. When the chopper's hovering close to the ground, or the mountain in this case, it's very, very chaotic. Snow and ice are flying everywhere. When they were lowering the litter, climbing ranger Nick Hall, who had taken lead that day over the operation, reached up, grabbed, and unhooked the litter from the line that was being lowered by the Chinook. When he did so, the litter was caught in the backwash of the helicopter, and it knocked him off his feet, causing him to fall 3,000 feet, suffering multiple massive injuries in the process. When rangers arrived at the scene, Nick Hall was dead. This photo of Mount Rainier was taken the day after the accident from my hospital room. It was a daily reminder for the next six days while I was there of what had happened, as if the injuries themselves were not enough. The photo currently being displayed was a day after everything had occurred, a bruised and broken person inside and out. While the physical pain had somewhat subsided, I was safe in many ways, my hardest journey had not even begun. I was put on blood thinners to allow the clot in my calf and my lungs to heal. I used crutches for three months with no way to hope that I would not need a hip replacement. Since my hip was out of place for so long, they believe eight to nine hours, I was at risk for something called avascular necrosis, which is just a fancy word for essentially saying that my femoral head uh, could have died. Once I was cleared of that, I began to rehab in order to learn how to walk again. When you don't use something for so long, you have to start over. I went from crutches to using a cane and then to nothing at all with a significant limp. All in all, it took me a year before I could walk without noticing a difference. One thing about rehab, generally speaking, people don't like it. It forces them to work on their issues. I personally loved rehab because I saw it for what it was. It was progress and it was hope. Something I have left out is how much I had to depend on others for literally everything. Meals, getting dressed, bathing, and as much as it humbled me, even help going to the bathroom. The physical recovery was only half the battle, you see. I had a hard time wrapping my mind around how someone could have lost their life, saving mine. At a memorial service for Nick, several days after the accident, a fellow climbing ranger said the following, Nick Hall was remembered as a quiet man. He wasn't much for chit chat, but he did radiate a quiet inner strength. Mountains like Mount Rainier can never be made safe which makes people like Hall all the more important to the rest of us. Nick Hall died doing what he was trained and prepared to do, saving lives during a highly technical rescue under difficult and unforgiving conditions. Tomorrow or the next day, we'll be back on the mountain, going into the storm as others are coming out of it. You see, it's that picture. It's Nick Hall choosing to run to the storm that day, knowing that the risks were there, but he did it anyway for someone that he didn't even know, me. Climbing Ranger Nick Hall's a hero, and there's not a day that goes by that I have not thought of him or the sacrifice that he made that day for myself and for my team. Now, who here has seen the TV show, I think is one of the greatest of all time, Friday Night Lights? You guys seen that? Okay, so Coach Taylor has a quote that really struck me after the accident. He says, give us all who are gathered here today the strength to remember that life is so very fragile. We are all vulnerable, and we will all, at some point in our lives, fall. We will all fall. We must carry this in our hearts, that what we have here is special, that it can be taken from us. And when it is taken from us, we will be tested. We will be tested to our very souls. We will now all be tested. It is these times, it is this pain, that allows us to look inside ourselves. Every man at some point in his life is going to lose a battle. He's going to fight and he's gonna lose. But what makes him a man is that in the midst of that battle, that he does not lose himself. Through time, rehab, love from friends, colleagues, and family members, I have made what most would consider a full recovery. 
I've been put back together again. I can walk, run, and heck, I can even dance from time to time without anyone ever actually knowing that there was an injury. Many have asked, well, what now? Well, the truth is, I don't know. I don't know why I survived against all odds and Nick Hall lost his life. But I know that I'm thankful. I'm thankful that myself and that my entire team survived that day. I'm thankful for the opportunity not to leave my wife a widow after one year of marriage. I'm thankful for the opportunity to bring my son Luke and my daughter Ruth into this world. Now, I don't consider myself special or unique, but what happened that day was, in fact, unique and special. There's no reason that I should be alive today that I'm hopeful to find out one day why I'm still here. The word that I was given when asked to speak to today was perseverance. And the definition of perseverance is persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. It took perseverance to train to climb Mount Rainier. It took perseverance to wait for my rescue. It took perseverance to complete rehab for my leg and to recover emotionally. And it takes perseverance every day to live with the fact that I am alive because someone else died. I never want to take that for granted. I do have to tell you two amazing things that have occurred since the accident. First, one of the medics who goes by Hot Rod that was on the helicopter that day and who visited me every day <coughs> in the hospital and has even been to Waco. We've become friends and he was instrumental in my recovery. And secondly, and most amazingly, I have a relationship with Nick Hall's father. The man who lost his son has extended kindness and forgiveness to me so that I could, could forgive myself. We all call each other and text each other on a consistent basis, and last summer, he invited me to visit him in Maine. Here's me with a picture of Carter Hall, Nick's father, and Aaron Hall, Nick's brother. And I know that it takes perseverance every day for them to live with the pain of losing Nick. My story's not meant to scare you or to keep you from doing adventurous things in your lifetime. It's actually the opposite. I'm still very much an outdoorsman, and I love doing adventurous things. I encourage you today to do whatever it takes to pursue your passions and to persevere through life's obstacles. And remember that tomorrow isn't promised. So what will you live for today? Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Okay, any questions? Yes, ma'am. That's a tricky question. Um, yes, so the question was, have I climbed any mountains since then? Um, the answer to that is yes, um, but I have not climbed uh, what would be considered, uh, I haven't mountaineered any mountains since then. So I think that it's um, an important lesson that whenever you do anything in life that you ask, um, who are the people that I'm doing it with? And do the people who you're with, does everybody know what they're doing? Are they competent? Are they skilled in what there is that they're doing? And so that was the life lesson. A lot of people will come to me and say, hey, because uh, I work at Baylor, there's a lot of college students that love the idea of climbing mountains. And a lot of people think that I would say, no, 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 don't ever climb again. Actually, I tell people the opposite. I tell people, absolutely, you should go and climb mountain here. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, um, and it's a, it's a miracle uh, all in itself. And so I highly encourage you guys to take a look at that. But I always encourage you to make sure that the people that you're with uh, know what they're doing. And I encourage you to, uh, to be safe. Um, he was formerly um, in the armed service, but he was uh, acting in that capacity as a climbing ranger who worked for the park service. But the operation was a joint operation between the army and the climbing rangers. So they need help with uh, flying of the helicopter portion, and so um, they brought them in that day. Oh, and um, I kind of wanted to let you guys know that I actually stayed in an army facility. So um, it's still a lot of, a lot of uh, there's a couple unknown pieces. But um, for whatever reason, they wanted us there. Um, and I think one of the big reasons was um, the three of us who were really, really hurt, um, they were all significant injuries, multiple broken bones, uh, pulmonary embolism, dislocated joints, uh, cracked spine, there was a broken, uh, broken nose, another dislocated hip, uh, cracked vertebrae. And so um, I'm incredibly thankful for the government that they took care of us. Uh, but they wanted us there. there. They could have taken us to a private hospital, but they actually chose, no, we want us want them here. Um, and I think it's because they're used to dealing with significant injuries 
um, and that they felt they were the best equipped to take care of us. And I have, they were incredible. Like I have incredibly uh, fond memories of the people who were there and the people who took care of us that day. Well, actually for, for six days. So. Yes, ma'am. I'm so sorry. Oh, on the life list. Absolutely. The life list has not died. Um, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to have a life list. And I just crossed off one in October, which was to go to Iceland and do what's called the Ring Road. And so it's a little over 800 miles. Um, Hannah and myself, and then we went with another couple. They had their own RV. We had our own RV. And we essentially circumvented the entire island of Iceland. Um, and it was unbelievable. So I'm continuing to always add stuff to the life list. I encourage you guys to do it. If you write it down and you tell people this is what I'm going to do, then you're more likely to actually do it. Oh, a quick funny story about that. When I did the marathon, Ann and I were just dating at the time. And so I knew that if I told her, if I registered and paid, and that I told her, that then that would make it real. And so I had told myself that even if I had to crawl across the finish line, <laughs> that I was going to finish that marathon because I didn't, didn't want to embarrass myself. Yes, sir. Uh, do you still plan to climb the top of the North America? Oof. That is a, uh, that's a difficult one. And so um, here's the challenge with that, is that I saw um, the uh, pain that I caused my family and my friends at the time. And so today, that's not an acceptable risk with a five and a three-year-old. Um, if this was when I was in college and I was single, then managing that risk uh, would probably be different. And also, uh, I'll, I'm looking at Hannah when I say this, as I get older, um, I could see an opportunity for me to be able to do that. But right now, my kids and my wife and my family mean too much to me um, that that's not an acceptable risk. But backpacking, going to Iceland, living life to the fullest, those are risks that I'm willing to take. And so I think those are always in constant tension wherever it is that you are in life. Great question. So, um, yeah. So the question was, why did I have to? Why did they tell me that I was going to have to spend the night? So, I was. They were coming to get me, but when um, they were lowering the litter, the third litter for my other teammate, that's when Nick Hall uh, was blown off the mountain essentially, and he fell. And so, at that point, they ceased the operation because both the army and the park service said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! This is too risky," because they had just realized that, they, that Nick Hall had, had passed. They, they flew down, circled, there was no signs of life. They lowered, lowered a ranger. He had no signs uh, of responsiveness, and so he, he was dead. And so they didn't want, which I completely respect, to put other people in harm's way, because uh, he was incredible. I mean, he was elite um, amongst climbing rangers, and so the thought was, hey, if he just died, why are we gonna put additional people in? There was a decision that was made three or four uh, hours later, which interesting, ironic thing that uh, I teach a small class at Baylor, it's called uh, BU 1000, and essentially it's for incoming students. One of the students that I happened to have several years ago's father was the commander that was over the operation, which is just crazy how things work. But uh, anyway, a decision was made that they thought that <coughs> there would have been multiple casualties, including myself, and including several of my teammates if they didn't make one more attempt. And so the thought was, they did, were, not, were not able to get Nicole's body off the mountain for several days. I think it was either four or five days because the storm was so big. And so the thought was, if they don't get us off the mountain, the storm's gonna pin us down. And so that it would have been more. And so they chose to risk their lives additionally to come after us again. So that's a great question. Yes? Could you explain how Nicole died? Sure. Um, so a litter is a stretcher. And so the, it's too heavy for them to carry those up. So the Chinook comes in, it lowers the litter. A ranger will unclip that litter, okay? And then essentially set it down and they'll put you in that litter, secure you. The chopper then comes back in, hooks it and leaves. When they were lowering the litter, he was not, uh, he didn't have an anchor into the mountain. So he chose um, for whatever reason, that hate, that wasn't something that he needed for protection. And so when he unhooked it, the combination of the elements, because it was incredible, incredibly windy that day, along with the backwash of the propeller, when he unclipped it, that essentially, that litter swung like a sail. And when it did, it carried him, and he essentially lost footing 
and fell at 3,000 feet. The same 3,000 feet that we would have fallen had our team member not fallen into the hole, into the crevasse. I did not see it. Uh, there was a gentleman that was on me. That's how wild and crazy that it was as far as commotion. Um, he was holding me to make sure that I myself didn't fly off. Um, so I didn't see it. Um, the, um, the mental picture, though, uh, has always stayed with me. And I don't think haunted is the word, but it's something that I definitely hold in deep respect um, that that's how somebody died <coughs> trying to get me, because I was the next person. Yes, sir. How deep the hole was? Was it like 13 feet? From the picture, I think we could see it, we could bring it up. Yeah, all these pictures were taken from the day of. I mean, I'm going to say at least 50 feet. You can see right here, I just want you to see the force. This is the top part of the mountain, okay? This is the down part of the mountain. Notice that you can't see the rope. That's how hard and fast that it was. So essentially, I was leading the group and our back team member slipped, and it created a pendulum. So when I self-arrested and put my axe in, I was ripped from the ice, which is why I ended up on the bottom. And whenever we were tumbling, she fell in and she hung us, okay? Like, she saved our life. If had she not fallen in with that rope, then we would have continued to fall down. Or all fall into a larger crevasse. So you can see that picture right there, that was taken right before the fall. Right there, that's me in the red jacket with the metal picket coming out of my backpack. And so you can see why whenever I heard falling, I said, hey, this is it. This is how in the world would somebody survive that. Okay, any other questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Well, I continue with my children. Oh, I've got so many things for my kids for the life list. Like they're they. And also, I don't know how much you know about Hannah, but uh, I don't know, you guys know about the Enneagram. She's a seven, and so she wants all of that and more. And so, like, we are both a really, really good team of let's go, let's go, let's go. So, absolutely, yeah. I'm hoping to instill that in them as well. So, and if you're asking, hey, will they be able to climb mountains? I think that will be a discussion that we'll all have to have once across that bridge when we get to it. So, well, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to come and speak to you guys.